As with any real-time strategy game, gaining experience and therefore knowledge in Age of Empires 2 is the key to improvement. Every win proves your competence, and every loss proves you have more to learn. The most valuable information is often only understood when experienced firsthand. You can discuss strategy and best practices all you want, but the game isn't played in your head at your leisure, it's played in real time against a real opponent. Just possessing knowledge may help you if you ever find yourself on an Age of Empires quiz show, but applying that knowledge is how you actually win games. It's easy to memorize unit counters. Anyone who's been playing the game for a while knows that skirmishers win against archers, but it's more difficult to understand why skirmishers counter archers and when this is actually not true. Knowing when you need fletching or when you need armor, or maybe no upgrades at all, is not something that you can just read and then be able to make the right call in-game. In a game of incomplete information, even if you know to get fletching for skirmishers when fighting behind walls, and armor when fighting close up, you may still not know which to get because you might not have proper scouting of your opponent. If you don't know if you're up against one range or two range archers, then you might under or over invest into defense. Many questions related to strategy in this game can be answered with a simple it depends, and it's up to you to figure out in which cases you should make which decisions. To answer these questions, you must be able to take into account as much relevant information as possible. This is where experience and not just knowledge is important. You need to know what information is actually relevant to a situation before you can take it into account. Since the game is so complex, you're unlikely to get an answer to a question involving strategy that includes every case. The simpler the question, the more complex the answer. The opposite is also true. If a question is asked that includes many variables, the answer can be more precise. To demonstrate this, I'll be answering two questions. The first question is well formulated and relevant to a specific situation. This is the kind of question you should ask if you want to learn from a loss. The second question is much simpler and requires the answer to be much more complex to be useful. The situation is the same for both. The Civs are Teutons versus Britons, and the Teutons player wants to know what he could have done versus archers from Britons. A good question includes any information that is relevant to the situation. The timing, Civs, how many ranges, upgrades, your own strategy, and the map are all things to consider. This question would be something like this. If I'm Teutons playing against the Britons, what should I do against a two-range archer opening on Arabia? I had forward gold and no access to stone, so I just got taken off of gold and couldn't do anything. The answer to this could be, you can open scouts into skirmishers. The reason to go scouts is that the scouts can put pressure on the opponent and force walls. They can also pick off lower numbers of archers if they're separated. You can also track enemy army movement and unit numbers with them. Constant skirmisher production from one range should work against two range archers, provided you get 1-1 one -one upgrades before taking a big fight. The range can come up after you have 9 on food in Feudal Age. If you wait too long, then you won't have enough numbers to deal with the archer mass. If you have something like 10 skirmishers or more, or your gold isn't safe, you can consider getting elite skirmisher upgrade while booming on 3TC in Castle Age. If your opponent adds knights to deal with your skirms, you can add some monks. If he goes for a forward siege with crossbows, you can add your own mangonels to deal with them. Even this answer doesn't cover every relevant situation that could occur in this game, so with this knowledge in mind, playing another Teutons vs Britons 2 range archers game and losing will give you more specific questions to ask. You might try elite skirmishers, and the opponent just counters you with his own elite skirmishers using the Britons faster working ranges to get more units out. Then, if you ask about this situation but focus on what to do if Britons matches your skirmishers, maybe you'll get answers saying to switch to knights or add more mangonels. At this point, both units will deal with the skirmishers, but could be used in different situations. Since knights cost a lot to tech into, you can only get them if you scout that the opponent is going skirmishers early enough. If you're being attacked by 20 skirmishers and you don't have any knights yet, you might be better off going for mangonels because they're cheaper and more useful earlier since they require no upgrades. Again, this advice can't account for everything that is going on in real time. The advice might change completely based on the state of the game at 14 minutes versus at 15 minutes. Since this was a well-formulated question, a useful answer was given. The second question is less detailed, which requires a very complex answer. How do I play against Britons as Teutons? If you ask a question like this, there are two valid answers. 
One is a wall of text that takes 10 minutes to read and an hour to write. The other is it depends because nobody has time for that. Asking questions that are too general do not provide as relevant answers. This previous example was a good way to learn from a game after a loss. You should think of a detailed question and then try to answer it yourself first. If you come to your own conclusions, you'll be more likely to recall them when needed. If you rely on others to do the deep thinking and only care about the result, you will only know what's good, but not why it's good. Let's go back to Feudal Age and talk a bit about how archers interact with skirmishers. It's not as simple as skirmishers beat archers. There are many situations where you will want to fight skirmishers with your archers. Archers have 4 base attack and skirmishers have 3 base pierce armor. This means that archers do 1 damage per hit against skirmishers when both units have no upgrades. The two upgrades that you can get in Feudal Age for both of these units are fletching and padded archer armor. Fletching increases range and attack of archers, skirmishers, and watchtowers by one, and just attack for town centers. Padded archer armor increases melee and pierce armor by one for archers and skirmishers. Ranged units are usually thought of as a backline unit that shouldn't really be getting attacked by the enemy much, so attack and range is usually prioritized over armor. A tanky unit that sits in the back out of danger in fights doesn't make a lot of sense. Getting fletching for archers first is therefore a no-brainer. Since you're also looking for villager pickoffs, increasing your range and damage also helps there. Against skirmishers specifically, fletching doubles your damage output from 1 to 2. The extra range also helps you to hit and run without taking damage much more easily. Of course, this is all assuming that the skirmishers have no upgrades. The decision of which upgrade to prioritize as the skirmisher player is a bit more complex. A lot of the time you'll want to get both upgrades for skirmishers, but that has the side effect of delaying your castle age time by a lot. Getting upgrades for only a small number of units is also not ideal as you may have been better off with more units and less upgrades. This is where reading the game to decide which upgrade to go for and how many units to make is important. Since archers will always have fletching, by default we should consider getting armor as reducing the archer's damage output by half. This effectively makes 3 skirmishers feel like 6 when looking at their ability to tank damage. Skirmishers mainly rely on their plus 3 bonus damage against archers, so missing out on one extra attack is not that bad. The lack of range can be compensated by considerably more survivability, so fletching is somewhat devalued in this specific instance. Pure archers versus your skirms is fairly common, but not the only thing you'll be up against. A lot of the time the opponent will open with men at arms before adding archers, so you may have to fight these with the skirmishers as well. Men at arms have 1 pierce armor and skirmishers do 2 base damage, which means they do 1 damage per hit. With fletching however, your skirmishers start doing 2 damage. Since skirmishers are also faster than men at arms, you should never be taking damage from them, so armor is just not as important here. As you can see, the upgrade that you get depends on how you're going to be using your skirmishers. If you're using them as a backline against men at arms or archers behind walls, then fletching is better. If you're using them as a frontline against pure archers, researching padded archer armor and then trying to get close to the archers can be effective. But wait, there's more! If both players are going pure skirmisher, armor actually does nothing. Since bonus damage is applied after accounting for armor, skirmishers will still do 3 damage to each other regardless of if armor is researched or not. In this case, more units or a faster castle age time is better than picking up armor. Technically armor is better when you're skirmisher versus scouts since scouts have 2 base pierce armor, which keeps fletching doing 1 damage, but you probably should invest your resources into spearmen, archers, or your own scouts instead. All that and we've only just barely covered going skirmishers versus archers. With the decision of which upgrades to get taken care of, we also need to learn how to actually control the units. 
If both players went fletching, the archer's player can potentially pick off individual skirmishers with focus fire micro pretty fast. Since skirmishers have to stand still for longer before they fire, they are much easier to hit compared to archers. Archers have a much shorter time where they have to stand still before firing, so they can be moving and therefore dodging for longer. It becomes more difficult to dodge projectiles at closer range, so with this in mind, the skirmishers should try to get close to the archers before firing so they don't miss. Of course, this also makes the archers not miss any shots, but skirmishers can rely on their bonus damage and armor to win the fight. Another reason why missing shots with skirmishers is so bad is their fire rate. They only attack twice for every three times an archer does, meaning that each missed shot is greater damage per second lost for skirmishers compared to archers. The slower fire rate of skirmishers also means that it's easier to outmicro them at max range. You just wait until they fire, dodge the volley, and then shoot them. This advice I'm about to give can be applied to many different engagements. If you have an advantage in a fight, you'll want to get closer to the enemy to prevent them from retreating and reduce the number of your own missed shots. Preferably you notice that you're winning the fight before your opponent, so you can start moving forward before your opponent starts retreating. This will let you pick off more retreating units, which will give you an even greater advantage. On the other hand, if you're losing a fight, try to fall back while kiting the enemy at max range. You'll be dodging projectiles and your opponent will be walking into them. This can sometimes swing the fight back in your favor, especially if you have reinforcements come in. The reason this is all relevant here is that the fight between archers and skirmishers can be decided after the first few volleys sometimes. Losing just one unit on either side can be enough to snowball a victory. In an even fight, if you dodge the first attack and one-shot an enemy, you can think of being a little bit more aggressive with your units, aka getting closer to secure the fight. If you know your army strength is less than your opponent's, retreating and regrouping with reinforcements is better than fighting a losing battle. Since archers and skirmishers are very different units, reading a fight is not as simple as counting the units and whoever has more wins. You have to account for army size, upgrades, and positioning. The first thing you have to do, especially as the archers player, is check the skirmishers upgrades. If you see fletching only, you can sometimes take a good fight if you have a small numbers advantage. If you see armor, then unless you outnumber something like 3 to 1, you should probably just run. Sometimes you'll want to take what might be considered a bad fight if it helps in some other way. For example, if you fight 5 armored skirmishers with 12 archers and lose 8 of your archers but kill the 5 skirmishers, you may now be able to kill a few villagers, which makes it worth it. Taking risky fights like this can sometimes be good, but often you'll want to just run from bad fights until you have more units or better technology. As the skirmisher player against archers, getting early armor gives such an army strength boost that it can often catch the opponent off guard if they're not paying attention. If the archers are camping a hill, just a few skirmishers with armor can approach the hill and kill everything. The key is to get as close to the archers as possible so they can't dodge. If done correctly, you can chase down fleeing archers for quite some time. Hit and run micro is necessary for this to be effective. It's not enough to just take the hill, you have to pursue the enemy and finish them off. If you kill 4 archers for free, that's 280 resources lost for the opponent. If we assume both players macro is equivalent, this means you are ahead by 280 resources. Investing these resources properly can allow you to get even more ahead. In Feudal Age, there are 3 things that you can invest into at this point, more army, more upgrades, or Castle Age. If your opponent could take damage from aggression, in the case that he's playing with no walls or has forward resources, investing more into army and military upgrades can increase your lead. Since your opponent just lost his army, he either has to make a lot more archers, do a big tech switch to scouts, or make a tower to protect a key area. Either way, his castle age will be delayed, or his options will be more limited once reaching there. If he continues to make archers, you can deal with them in feudal age with your skirmishers. If he mixes in skirmishers, then once he's up to castle age, half his army will be unupgraded. If he texts to scouts, his castle age time will be greatly delayed, so you can try to defend and get up faster, or maybe just start adding your own archers which will deal with them when behind walls. If he towers a key area, you can either attack somewhere else or fall back since he's likely up to castle age. Since a tower costs 125 stone, he won't have stone for town centers, so likely he'll go for a 1 TC push which you can prepare for. 
We could continue going through the nearly infinite if-else statements here, but as I said earlier, it's better if you do the deep thinking yourself so you truly understand why you're making these decisions. Back to what to do with that 280 resource advantage. If you think about it, if you gain a small advantage like this, you can basically get an economic tech for free, which will eventually pay for itself and more. Spending 175 resources on a mining tech or 150 on horse collar can be what you win in that fight. This kind of thinking is essential to knowing the level of greed you can have in a game. If you force your opponent to lose resources, it's like you know roughly how many resources you have to make investments that might not pay off right away with. A great example of this is if you're going full skirmisher and the opponent adds just a couple of knights with plus one armor to deal with your skirms. If the opponent doesn't realize that this is actually a horrible plan and sends the knights in to die without accomplishing anything, you're now very far ahead. Your opponent invested 175 wood into the stable, 150 food, 100 gold into bloodlines, 150 food into plus one armor, and 120 food, 150 gold into the two knights for a total of 845 resources wasted. You can now invest 275 wood, 100 stone into a new TC, buy 6 villagers for 300 food, and seed 3 farms for 855 resources. During the time that the 6 villagers are being created, they'll be chopping wood, so we can just say that by the time they're created, you can have a town center with 6 farmers. This is the correct number of farmers to keep this town center constantly producing villagers, so just by your opponent making that one bad call, he gave you enough advantage to gain an additional TC that can sustain itself forever. This turns your 855 resource advantage into a much, much greater one. Again, back to what can be done with the advantage gained from killing those four archers early. The final thing you can do is go up to castle age faster. If your opponent now has less army, then you can stop your own army production for a while and invest your wood into earlier farms, which will give you the 800 food you need to click up earlier. As long as you don't throw your army, then you can maintain your lead. This isn't completely true though, the skirmishers that you build in Feudal Age can sometimes feel like dead weight once you reach Castle Age. This is because your army's value depreciates over time. If you don't continue to invest into more units and upgrades, your earlier units become relatively worse as the game goes on. If you don't plan on going for elite skirmisher right away in Castle Age, then your feudal investment into skirmishers needs to be a short term plan. This means that you'll want to invest as little as possible into them for them to do their job. If you only need 5 skirmishers to push back the enemy archers, then you can stop at 5. Knowing how much army you need to produce comes with experience, and scouting what the opponent is doing helps you make that decision. If the opponent is making archers from 2 ranges, going for constant 1 range skirmisher can be good. Skirmishers train in 22 seconds compared to 35 seconds of archers, and they're also a hard counter unit, so 1 range against 2 range can be good. If you invest too much into skirmishers, it can delay your castle age and leave you susceptible to siege addition or night switch. You also can't apply as much pressure to the opponent if you open with full skirmisher a lot of the time, so it leads you to play more defensively while expanding your economy. Back to my original point, if you kill archers with skirmishers but then can't do anything else with them because you don't invest into their upgrades, it can be almost like they don't exist anymore. I'm not saying that if you go for feudal skirmishers that you should always invest into their castle age upgrades, but just don't think you're super far ahead if you get a few archer kills early but can't do anything else with your skirmishers. If you killed 280 resources worth of archers but invested 700 resources into basically dead weight once castle age arrives, then you are the one who's behind. Even basically useless units can serve a few purposes though. You can send them out on the map to reveal where the enemy is moving. This is pretty much the function of an outpost. If you have 6 skirmishers, it's like you have 6 scouts. Send a few to the sides of your base, and a few to scout your opponent's walls. A lot of the time you'll gain some useful information. Another useful purpose for leftover units is to delete them when you get housed. It can be like exchanging these units for 3 villagers sometimes. As the archers player, you can use this knowledge as well. If your opponent is heavily invested into skirmishers, you can easily counter this with mangonels. If you continue to make crossbowmen, then you can just add mangonels if the enemy skirmisher numbers get out of control. If your opponent only adds a few skirmishers, then you can just fight them with your crossbowmen. Even if the opponent attacks you, if he only has skirmishers and you're walled properly, or have a defensive siege workshop, you won't take too much damage. 
if you don't plan on attacking and you see the opponent has elite skirmisher upgrade, just greedily booming at home with a defensive siege workshop can be the best idea. Since elite skirmisher upgrade is 360 resources and the crossbone upgrade is 200 resources, just the fact that your opponent actually invested into castle age upgrades means you're ahead. If you see your opponent has bodkin arrow and leather archer armor as well, you know you're good to just sit at home and boom. After you've read the current state of the game, you can make better decisions about what to do. If your opponent is making a hard counter unit such as Elite Skirmisher or Pikeman, you can continue to make your gold unit if you add in your own counter counter unit such as Mangonels or Crossbowmen. If your opponent can't leave his base because you have map control, a lot of the time you can expand your economy while keeping the pressure on. For example, adding a forward siege shop against an enemy that is going Elite Skirmishers versus your Crossbowmen can force defensive siege, which delays the opponent's boom even more. Even if you can't push in, just forcing the opponent to invest into defense is already damage dealt, on top of their more expensive upgrades. There are so many ways that a game can play out, but if you can think of in terms of resources spent and resources lost, you can better predict your position in the game in comparison to your opponent. I'll emphasize this point one more time. Resources spent into military depreciate over time. If you invest into 10 knights but keep them doing nothing at home, you haven't effectively spent your resources. You would have been better off spending on economy earlier to get a larger army later. Of course, if you just make villagers with no army, then you might just die to an enemy attack. Reading the game to predict the appropriate level of greed will help you to gain advantages. If you expect an attack from the opponent but he never comes, the moment you stop army production can be the best time for you to attack. If you make 10 knights and your opponent invested those resources into economy and then started producing knights, you have a small window of opportunity to do damage while your opponent is behind in military. Since he invested into economy first, he will be ahead if you don't do damage. Try to reduce the guesswork in your play. Anytime you're making a wild guess about what your opponent is doing, try to confirm that guess with scouting. If you see that your enemy has multiple town centers, not many upgrades, or a small army count, you know he's probably not going to effectively attack you right away. In this case, you need to go for a big attack yourself if you're in a position to do so, or boom hard on three town centers to at least match the economy of your opponent. Anyways, I hope this was informative. I'll leave some of the other strategies that you might face up to you to think about. If you come to your own conclusions, you're more likely to remember them anyways. If you have any questions related to strategy or anything AoE related, join the Discord. We have discussions about various questions pretty much constantly. Okie dokie, see ya in the next one.